I was there 10 years. The <laughs> time, time changes. Uh, the last several years, I was vice president, and during that time, you might say I was the production manager in the office. That is, all the people, we had about 12 staff members, their programs, I worked with them on their individual programs, the particular things that they were bringing up for funding and recommending had to go through my office as sort of a quality control mechanism. So that was one thing. Before that, I had been uh, involved, and even at that time, I was involved, among other things, in a set of programs we were working with designed to help uh, reduce the gap that, that underprivileged or ethnically different children have when they attend school for the first time. Typically children who come from culturally deprived backgrounds or perhaps, perhaps ethnically different backgrounds or perhaps poverty backgrounds come to school uh, three to six months behind their cohort who come from educationally advantaged homes. That deficit, three to six months, typically grows to about a year after three years. They fall further and further behind as they go through school. At the time I'm talking about, which would have been mm, 1960, I'm going to, let's say five to seven or eight, uh, this was during the Johnson presidency, and there was a lot of talk about the educational gap and that the country was losing vital resources because children who were potentially productive citizens were caught in this bind that I've already described. And we were trying to find ways to prevent that deficit from occurring. There were several theories about how you might do that. One theory was you so in some way educationally inoculated the children before they went to school so they would not suffer the detriment that they otherwise would. Other theories suggested that what you needed to do was to enrich their curriculum while they were in school so they could benefit in ways that they were not able to because they didn't have the, didn't have the advantages that they might have had at home. Well, there were a variety of people doing things like that, and we probably financed, I'm going to say, five to ten such programs. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not quite sure about the number at this point, but several. And in general, the answer was you could do things that would help those children when they went to school. You could do things before they, at preschool level or at kindergarten level, so when they entered first grade, they were more like the children from Advantage Homes. And insofar as we had followed them, this wasn't a long-term study at that point, it seemed to be that, that that reduction of what was called the educational gap persisted over time, particularly if it were followed up. And that, that following up happens to be very important. We learned that later, but following it up happened to be very important. How were programs chosen? Those programs? Yeah. Well, the job of a, uh, a person at a foundation, my job, was to be aware of all the, co all the programs that you could find that had any relevance to that. Or in some cases, just if you couldn't find a program, you could find a talented uh, person in research or education or teaching who would be interested in doing it if they had the resources. So in a sense, the job of a foundation officer is, is twofold. One, it is by what you do to advertise the potential availability of resources. And secondly, to educate yourself as to where those resources are. That is, you're, if you're really doing your job, you should know, practically speaking, everybody in the country who is doing anything that's relevant to that work and have some idea about the differential quality of those programs or people.